Hi everyone, I'm Marisol Nichols. You may know me as an actress in different television and films, but you may not know that for the past 10 years I have worked as a contracted undercover operative in the field of human trafficking. I created my nonprofit, Foundation for a Slavery-Free World, and this podcast to help reach all of you, educate, and prevent this from ever happening to you or your loved ones. So welcome to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Let's get started. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have Antigone Davis. Welcome, Antigone. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We have so much to talk about, um, and I've been dying to have this conversation because it's probably the most thing that parents ask me about social media and how to keep their kids safe, and you are the woman in charge of all of that. So for my listeners, just so you know how giant Instagram is, they're up to, I believe this is correct, 2 billion users a month. Is that correct? I don't... I. Loath to, to say yes, but because I, without checking the number, <laughs> but yes, we have billions of users and billions of monthly active users on our platform. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And just like anything else that attracts a lot of people, obviously you're always going to get some bad people there as well. And that's the conversation that we're having today. So uh, just in June, Meta announced new safety features. So I wanted to talk about what is you know, Meta, Instagram, Facebook, doing um, for kids to allow them to have age-appropriate experiences online? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question, I'll, but I'll try to break it down into a few, a few buckets. Um, first of all, at a core, we have policies against this kind of content and these kinds of interactions on our, on our platform. But those policies are only as good as all the tools and technology that you put around them. So in addition to having those policies, we have all kinds of technology, artificial intelligence, for example, that we use in the background to try to identify um, content that violates our policies, um, as well as people who may be trying to reach out to children in a way that they, that they shouldn't be. So for example, we set teen accounts to private by default on Instagram, but we do other things as well. We don't allow unconnected adults to message minors. We have a classifier that we use to identify potentially suspicious accounts, and we don't allow those accounts to connect with minors. We won't surface minors in things like people you might know or in, explore, in, um, in other aspects where we recommend people on our platform to those people with that kind of a score on their account, that suspicious score. Now, thank you for saying all that. What would constitute a suspicious score? Yeah, well, we use thousands of signals to create that kind of a classifier. I don't want to share all the signals because people are bad actors, and the more we share those signals, the more they figure out how to go around them. But to give you an example of a type of signal that would be um, potentially suspicious, if we see an adult come onto the platform and all of a sudden make numerous requests or outreach or direct message requests to minors that they're not otherwise connected to, that's a signal that potentially they're, that adult is behaving in a suspicious way. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, I'm sure many parents will be very, very happy to hear that. Um, and does that suspicious signal you mentioned a little bit earlier, would that sort of block the suspicious individual from DMing and reaching out or commenting on a minor's platform? Yes. So if someone hits this hits up against this classifier, there are certain precautions we take. It takes so they may not be able to message. If they go to um, on Instagram, if they go to connect with a minor, they won't see the friend request button, so they won't be able to actually friend friend that minor. That's great. Is that is that something new that just got implemented recently or is that it's within the last i don't know the exact timing of it, but with it's within the last few years beautiful that's great thank you um so what sort of like immediately what sort of tools and features can parents use particularly on on instagram and facebook and we'll put a video up um for those of you that are watching this to sort of show you what antigone is referring to but let's start out what tools and features are already there that parents can use 
to, to help keep their children safe. So one thing I want to make sure all parents are aware of is that we have a family center and that family center actually allows parents to set up supervisory tools. So a parent can go in and um, initiate setting up that that uh, that those supervisory tools with their teen. And once they do that, they will have visibility, for example, on Instagram to who their teen is following and who is following their teen. They can set some time limits around uh, the teen's act time on the platform. So for example, I know there are a lot of parents who think, you know, it's not really great for my teen to be on after a certain hour. So if nothing happens good between 11 a.m. and, you know, 6 a.m. And so they will, they can set parameters around uh, around their teens around their teens use on the platform what can teens actually do themselves to sort of block you know creeps to be i'm so honest. glad you asked that question i think you know one of the things that that um we all do. And we did, I mean, I look, I, I, as a teen growing up, I had to, I, we didn't have this technology for sure, but I also had to navigate whether it was on a public bus or on a subway, making sure that I knew the kinds of things to do to keep myself, keep myself safe. In addition to any other safeguard my parents might put in place. And so I would recommend to teens that they're, that they become very familiar with their privacy settings if someone tries to contact them and they don't feel like they know them, don't you don't have to accept that that contact. Additionally, if you see something or something doesn't feel right, you can report it to us and we will review it um, so that you can also block people. If you if someone is, is um, you've made a connection somehow and someone keeps connecting trying to reach out to you and you don't want them to, you can block them. So there are a number of different tools that we have we have in place. And I would recommend that people go to our safety center and to their privacy settings to and, and explore around. And inside of both our safety center and that family center I mentioned for parents, we also have a lot of resources from experts uh, where people get guidance as well. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, that kind of sort of leads me to my next question. So let's say, you know, because this never happens, you're a teen on, on Instagram, you're posting pictures, you get a DM from some creepy guy that's like, you're hot or you're beautiful. You want to hook up. Um, in addition to obviously blocking them, literally, how do they report it? Because now it's a message. It's not a post. But is there a way to sort of like tell on them just to be blunt? Yes. You, there are very easy ways to report. If you look, there's basically a little icon. You'll see it pretty clearly and you can just click on it and report it. And you can report messages and we encourage people to report messages. Not only do we, am I encouraging you here, but within our platform, if we see that there may be um, something going on, so say a teen is blocking or blocking and unblocking somebody, we'll prompt them with what we call basically a safety notice and say, and kind of give them, encourage them to go ahead and report. So if we see something that doesn't look right, we may pop up a safety notice to encourage them. I had no idea actually. Um, and then what happens once someone does actually report you know, a bad actor on one of these platforms. Yeah. So, well, we have a lot of technology in the background to prioritize certain reports. For example, if someone is reporting um, potential child exploitation or uh, sexualization of a minor, there are ways to, uh, to prioritize those reports because we want to get to the reports where someone may be in real harm's way as quickly as is possible. Um, when we get those reports and they are they are navigated, they are reviewed. They can be reviewed by our automated systems, but they can also be reviewed by by human reviewers depending on the type of the type of report. And if we find that that uh, content is violating, we will remove it from our platform. What is, people may not also know is that, that if something violates child exploitation laws or child exploitation policies, we re report that to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It's called a cyber tip. And those are, those are um, then investigated by them and made available to law enforcement for follow-up. So we do, if someone is engaging in illegal uh, child exploitation on our platform, we do take action to report that so that others can take action to stop that, those harms. That was actually my next question is, do you work in conjunction with either law enforcement or the center? And we actually did have Callahan Walsh on. I'm not sure where in the lineup he'll 
will end up airing him, but he went into very, very deep discussions on what the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children does. So for the audience that hasn't isn't familiar with their work, they're incredible, and please listen to them. And they partner with different organizations to find missing and exploited children. And so I'm very happy, Antigone, that, they're, that they work with, with Meta. That's fantastic. We have a very deep um, partnership with NICMIC. In fact, recently they launched something called Take It Down, which I do want your listeners to know about. And it's something that we supported and helped provide guidance on. Uh, What Take It Down is, is essentially, say you're a teen, you're on the platform and you share an intimate image of yourself. Maybe you thought this person, you had a relationship with this person, whatever the reason is, you've shared this intimate image. And now this individual is actually using that in some way to harm you. They're trying to share it with other people. They may be, may be threatening to share it with other people if you don't pay them money or if you don't meet them in person. You can go to take it down and make what's called a, basically a hash, a digital fingerprint of that image. Give that digital fingerprint to Nick Mick. Nick Mick shares it with us and any other members of industry that are participating. And if that person tries to share your image on our platform, we can use that digital fingerprint to prevent that from being shared on our platform and to stop that person from being in a position to basically extort you for something that you don't want to do. I love that. And and just for my audience members, so you understand, like this is talking about like someone who maybe was in a relationship even and sent like, okay, well, I sent him a picture, you know, of me in a bra or worse. Right. And you send that. And then that image is now out there everywhere and can be sold and traded or abused, or you can, it can be used to extort money or other things from you. And so this take it down is a humongous ginormous step in stopping um, this sort of abuse that goes on on the internet. And that hashtag, that digital fingerprint allows Meta and other, even other platforms to be able to trace that image and therefore take it down. So it's, this did not exist a year ago. It is it's a giant step. And so, you know, um, Antigone, you said you just go to take it down and put in your digital. That sounds confusing to most people in raw public. So can you walk us through simply how you do that? So there's basically you go to uh, Nick Mick's website. They will they will essentially give you a piece of I'm going to a software, a piece of software. But you don't need to understand that. Essentially, you click on something. It will allow you to put your image through this software. The software processes the image. You don't do anything. You basically think of it like uploading the image, except that it all happens on your device. So you don't have to share the image because it is horrifying to be in this situation. And then to think I have to now share my image again, which is usually a very intimate image with someone that I don't know. People aren't sharing the image with anybody they don't know on their device This software is basically downloaded onto your device. It makes a digital, like a numeric fingerprint of that image. You then share that with NCMEC. And this is all for the user. These are just clicks, like (laughs) click here, click there. And it takes and it shares that digital fingerprint with NCMEC. And then companies like ours take it from them. And when people try to share your image on our platform, it literally bumps, think of it like bumping up against the the image uh, fingerprint and not being able to get past it. So for those that are listening, Nick Mick's website and where you can actually do this, parents, teenagers, whoever, for yourself, for your friends, for your family, it's missingkids.org. Very simple. And we'll put a we'll put a hashtag and we'll put a link up for those of you that are watching. But for those of you who are listening, it's missingkids.org. That is the website. And then you can search for Take It Down. And I'm I'm so grateful for that partnership here along with Meta that that is really this is gonna go a long way in in preventing some some horrific abuse that's occurred out there. Um, which actually brings me to my next question, which was what partnerships does Meta have with and for children's safety? 
So we have a number of them. Nick Mick, as you obviously know, is one of them. We also partner with organizations, particularly in the, in the area of trafficking of young people, with organizations like Stop the Traffic. This is a really interesting organization. Essentially, what they do is they try to identify hotspots, and they actually use our platform of where they see trafficking occur. So One's, one that you'll have heard of, people talk about a lot, is trafficking that occurs around large sporting sporting events. But we, you may see trafficking, sex trafficking, and human trafficking um, in where there are areas of large refu refugees. I mean, there are lots of different types of places and things that, that may trigger um, trafficking situations. They find and identify those. Some of them, they use our platform to try to identify way, where they may be seeing clusters of trafficking. We then work with them to enable them to get ad through ad credits to get information to people in those areas so that they become more aware of what's happening in their area. They become more alert. This triggers social service organizations in those regions. It can also trigger just individuals. So say you're an individual, you're a refugee, you're trying to get out of a certain area you see promises on the internet of uh, will help you leave if you do X, Y, and Z, and all of a sudden you can end up in a, in a very challenging situation. They will surface information into those regions to let people know, here's what to look for, never hand over your passport, et cetera. Um, so that's another organization that we work with. We try to work with experts globally. So we want to make sure that because we are a global platform that we're doing this mm -hmm. with experts and, and organizations all around, around the world to ensure that we're getting them the right information, the right resources, um, blocking things from happening on our, on our platform. That's huge. I didn't know that, but that makes sense that you could use social media for those areas and target ads and target information to the people that are sort of around that area to also report things if they see something. And that that's that's a really beautiful way of using using social media. I love that. Yeah, we have something, we have a trusted partner channel where we do a lot more of this, where we bring in, um, where we're connected to organizations and they also provide us with signals. So if they see something happening, they will flag it for us. And we have teams of specialists who do um, basically what you might think of as a network disruption, because unfortunately, bad actors are everywhere, they're online and they're offline, and they use platforms like ours and others to try to connect with, with each other. And so we have a trusted partner channel where if people see something like this happening on our platform, they can report it to us, and we can use that information to basically look further on our platform to try to identify that network. And in I think between to 2020 and 2022, we found about 27 different networks that we removed from the platform, about close to 500,000 accounts that we were able to remove from the platform that were trying to either traffic uh, minors or traffic others or share this kind of content across um, the, eco the internet ecosystem. Yeah, th thank you for that. And that brings me actually to my next question, which is um, the Wall Street Journal article. So I I'm sure you've been asked about it a million times, but for my listeners, they may not have heard um, Meta's response. So just for my listeners here, so basically it was found that on Instagram, there was explicit hashtags being used for these bad actors, for these pedophiles to be able to talk to each other and share images, hashtags such as pedo whore and preteen sex. And the accounts were, you know, they were essentially using <laughs> Facebook and Instagram to advertise child sexual abuse material and, you know, making these accounts, making it look like this was a child selling their own images. And it was, it, it was obviously a shock to, to everyone that this was happening. And I know um, they reached out to you, Antigone, and I know some things have gone in place. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, these are, I mean, these are horrific crimes and these are, are, you know, it's very important to us that we are working with the all of the individuals, both offline and online, who are trying to address address these crimes. So it was, while you never want to know that something like this, you never want something like this on your platform, it is really 
um, we were glad to, to find out about it um, and to identify this network and be able to, to, to remove it. Um, what we do when we're in this area is, I would say, sort of multi, multi-pronged. We do a lot to ensure that that not only first and foremost that uh, bad actors can't find minors and can't connect with minors. That's our top and most important goal: is making sure that minors that these individuals are not able to connect connect with minors. We also want to make sure that this content is not being shared on our platform or sold on our platform or traded on our platform. And then the third piece of this is making sure that the people who are bad actors aren't able to connect with each other on our platform mm -hmm. and then go somewhere else to commit their their heinous crimes. And so those are the ways that sort of the three ways we think about it and are, and are looking at it. In this particular case that the Wall Street Journal reported on, what was happening were bad actors were using our platform to find other bad actors, people who had a similar interest, using hashtags like what you talked about, or even things that are, are um, you know, you mentioned ones that like you sound very clearly indicate their interests, but they also try to obfuscate. So they use things like the right. cheese pizza emoji, which to you or to me doesn't mean anything. Oh, I went to, I had a you know, slice of pizza, but for them, it's basically CP, child pornography. And they're using that to signal an interest in child pornography. This is an adversarial space. We take these hashtags down on an ongoing basis. They then change the hashtags to, to find each other. In the case of the Wall Street Journal, they were using these hashtags to find each other. The accounts, luckily, weren't actually sharing a significant amount of imagery because our systems are very good using those digital fingerprints to find those images and remove them. And in fact, they don't want you to share those images because that's an easier way for us to find these kinds of accounts and take, take them down. Um, in this case, we had not found this particular um, this particular network of bad actors. We have since removed those bad actors and fanned out and removed other connecting accounts that the, even the Wall Street Journal had not identified. And this was research that had been done by the Stanford Internet Observatory that informed that informed that story. But we also had, uh, put in place a child safety task force to advance some ongoing work that we had going, as well as to make sure that there were other whether there were other places that we needed or wanted to do to do more. So I mentioned earlier to you that we have a classifier that we use to find um, potentially suspicious accounts. We've used that classifier to not allow those accounts to connect with minors. We're now using that classifier to not allow people with that bad score to connect with other people with that bad score. So we're using it to not only break that uh, uh, suspicious account from connecting with minors, but from connecting with other suspicious accounts. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do to break down that sort of third bucket I mentioned of where you have bad actors trying to find each other to to trade. I mean, the good news of that Wall Street Journal story was that most of the content was not being shared on our platform. They were basically using our platform to connect with each other and then going to other platforms to trade or share that content, which is why it's essential that we don't do this work alone and why we care a lot about working with other members of industry and are part of a, a, tech, a coalition of technology companies that work together on these issues as well. Thank you for that. That I love that there was there was even more done, and that unfortunately, as horrific as that was or could have been, that something such so great came out of it, and more and more and more safety protocols went in. That's that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned something very interesting, and I don't think my users know that. And if you can talk a little bit about it, you talked about the little emoji symbols. Yeah. So. Yeah. So for those of you, like I post, you know, I'm, I'm an actress, so I'll post something. And the first three posts that come up are porn. Always the first three comments, excuse me, that will come up on my feed. And I know it's porn just by the little symbols. There'll be a tongue symbol or a purple devil horn symbol. So I don't even have to click on it and I can just erase it immediately. The cheese pizza, um, you know, Antigone mentioned that that is used to signal, hey, we have child pornography here. Are there other um, 
emojis that parents and teens and just users in general can look out for to know not to click on that. Yeah, I would love to say there's a big set and, that, and it'll stay the same. And if I tell you these five, unfortunately, it's quite an adversarial space. There are ones that we know, for example, the cheese pizza one, egg, the eggplant one, a map, the map, so they're they they're constantly changing. Um, some of them are acronyms for different words. Some of them are to indicate certain types of interests. What you know, what I would say is, I can't give you a, a, a list that will be forever. Um, my my recommendation, probably to people, is if you don't know the individual, if you're unconnected from the individual, if for any reason something raises your spidey sense, don't click on it. Maybe go to, for a teen, maybe go to your parent and ask. If your parent's not entirely sure, ask another a, another adult. But it's better, My, I, I would say exercise caution. This is a big space. It's a great space for connecting. It's a great space for finding people who have similar interests as you. But, it, but you also have to be cautious. It is a big space with a lot of people in it. And that requires um, being thoughtful, being mindful of, of who you're engaging with. Well said, well said. That's also what I tell my daughter is just like, look, use your instincts, do that spidey sense, that inner voice that says, hmm, I don't know about this. Trust that. And, yeah. you know, to my listeners, all it takes is one swipe, one click, and you don't want to see certain things that you cannot and will not be able to get out of your head. It's sort of like, you can't unsee it. Yeah, and I really would recommend to users to, if you encounter this content, if someone approaches you for this content, if someone approaches and asks you to share this content, please report it to us. I mean, one of the things that we do see is that users think, oh, if I just share it again, I can like show people how terrible it is. And if I show people how terrible it is, people may take action. This is the kind of content that you should never share again. Whomever is in that um, image, image or video is being victimized. It is you are re, uh, unintentionally maybe re-victimizing them. Report it to us. We will take action. We will take it down. We will send it to the appropriate authorities. Um, but it is much better to do that than to share it um, with somebody else. And yes, to your point, if something comes through, don't engage anymore. Find an adult or someone that you can trust to take it take it forward. We will try to help you. We will try to get you the resources, connect you with who with whom you need for support. Um, there are people out there. You aren't alone if you do encounter something like this, or if you do get um, inadvertently tricked into, or whatever the reason is that you've shared this kind of content. Um, do reach out. Thank you. And and you brought up a good point of like, if you inadvertently share some content, and this is for parents, this is for teens, this is for adults, this is for everyone. There is something out there that we've talked to in a few little, in different episodes that we've done, which is sextortion. Yeah. But I do know that these social media platforms are used a lot for this sort of thing. So I wanted to to Antigone have you comment on, we've talked about it already, but what is exactly sextortion? And again, repeat what you guys are doing about it and, and what tools people can use to help themselves uh, to get out of it. So sextortion comes in many different types, but essentially what's happening is someone um, is has gotten an image from you that is um, puts you in a vulnerable position, an intimate image of you. And then they use that image in, in potentially different ways. They may ask for money um, and, they, and they say, I won't share it with other people as long as you pay me a certain amount of money. They may, depending on how they, what's happened prior to sharing the image, say insist on trying to meet with you or they're gonna share that image or they may ask for other images um, in, or, in order to prevent them from sharing, sharing that image. 
all what what is common to all of them is that they're asking you to do something that you don't want to do or that will harm you in some way in order to not share this to share this image and um i would say a few things people should be aware of if you're engaging with someone online and they suggest they share they may even share an image with you first and then ask for that image be suspicious be cautious things that maybe are too good to be true, truly are too good to be true. Um, if you don't know this person offline, and even if you do know this person on offline, you may have a relationship with this person. If you are feeling uncomfortable sharing this image, it, that's a good signal that you may not want to share this image. All that said, Things happen. People share images. You, it could have happened in the context of someone that you really loved or who's told you that they really love you. So don't spend a lot of time blaming yourself if you end up in that situation. Trust me, I know from my job, it happens. Reach out. Report it to us. Use take it down. All of those things together, we can use them to help prevent that image from being shared and get the resources that you need and the support that you need to take legal action if someone is doing something criminal, which in most cases the, like this they are, or to just get you the emotional and social supports that you need to make it through this situation. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, Antigone, my podcast is, is it very much focuses on empowering, empowering parents, empowering teenagers, teachers, everyone and anywhere to identify and and prevent trafficking to ever occur or prevent sexual abuse from ever occurring and i always believe it's it's education and we've talked about all the things that that um there are in place especially for instagram and just if there's anything else that we haven't covered any other guardrails that you can talk to um and mention to my audience so that they are better educated to protect themselves and their loved ones I mentioned earlier um, some of the tools that we have, but um, you know, your privacy settings are your friend, um, and you should think about those. Um, we we do not allow unconnected adults to connect with you, but you also what does that may... mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Unconnected adults to connect with you? Can you explain so that? If you're not already connected with someone on our platform. So you may be in, in, on Instagram, you may, you may be connected to your mom or your dad or an aunt or an uncle or a parent or a, a cousin on our, our platform. But if, if you don't, aren't otherwise connected with that adult, we aren't going to, that adult isn't going to be able to message, to message you. Um, Thank you. If someone connected to you is messaging you and you're uncomfortable, block them. If they can, if they can try to find other ways to reach out to you, or they or they've, or they've shared something with you that that you think is, in, you know, uncomfortable or wrong or shouldn't be happening, report them to us. It's very hard, I think, sometimes for teens to to report. Um, some of the work that we've done indicates that they feel like they're tattletaling, or they're or they're um, the person's going to know. I want people to know that when someone reports something to us, we don't go and tell the pe person that you've reported to us, so you can report it to us, and we will take action. We don't out you. Um, we we want to make sure that you feel safe safe to to report it to us. Um, you also um, can block, and we will that will not be shared with the individual whom, whom you've blocked. So these are things that you can do in a way that is not going to signal to another person that, that you, um, that you've take that you've taken action. And, um, those are the things that I think are primarily really important to know. I think the other thing is if someone reaches out and you don't know them, there are lots of ways that you, or you think you know them, but you're not really sure. You can kind of check on check on that. So I know, for example, my daughter used to, she would be, you know, out with her friends when she was in high school and she'd meet somebody at somebody else's house or at a party. And she might get a, get a, like, you know, a request to, to um, follow them or to uh, become friends with them. And she was, thought it was the right person, but she wasn't really sure it was the right person. You can check through your own friend networks if that was the person. So if you know I was at, you know, 
my best friend's party, go look at her, go back over to her, the people she's following and make sure it's that actual, that actual person um, to, to ensure that you're connecting with the right people or the people that you mean to be. Exactly. Um, the other thing that I also tell parents is I'm like, look, just not even parents. The, uh, the other thing I tell my audience is like, look, be careful of what you post. Yeah. Like, you know, step zero of this is be really aware of what you're attracting when you post a sort of sexualized picture of yourself, especially if you are a teenager. It's like, you know, pouring honey down there for bees. There are bad actors. There's, they are there. So be aware of that. Parents, be aware of what your kid is posting. Secondly, common sense. Please don't post pictures of yourself outside of the name of your high school or your car with your license plate on it or what your house looks like or going to vacation at Big Bear at X, Y, and Z Hotel just think with common sense and keeping yourself safe and anonymous for those bad actors. Other than that, feel free, but think with giving your actual location that you're spreading this out wide on the internet. And even though it's mostly to your friends, there are other people out there that have access to that. Um, anything you'd like to add to that, Antigone? No, I, uh, thank you. I want to bring you home, home with me, so I can show you <laughs> with my daughter and all her friends. I yes, I totally agree. And one thing I want people to know is not only do we not allow, um, you know, child exploitation material on our platform. If someone sexualizes a minor on our platform, if an adult sexualizes a minor, that violates our policy. So if you put up a, a, a photo of you and your friends in bathing suits in your bikinis at the beach and some uh, creepy adult makes a sexualizing comment underneath that, you can report it to us. Please do. That comment violates our policies. You, you should be able to post a picture of yourself in a bikini at the beach having fun without having someone post that underneath your, your image. So you can block it, but you also can report it to us. It violates our policies. There's this amazing feature in Instagram that I absolutely love where you can block certain words from being posted in comments on your page. So if for the first time you're giving your teenager, okay, go ahead, or 10 year old or whatever, they're gonna have their cute little, you know, their Instagram account. You can go in there ahead of time and go, these certain words are blocked from being posted in the comments and you can block sexually explicit words so that your child won't even see them. It's a phenomenal tool out there that not a lot of people know about. So I also wanted to mention that it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a great tool. People use it in multiple different ways. So it's our comment filtering tool. You can use it in exactly the way that you described. You can also use it, and I, I know this isn't ex what you cover on your on on your podcast, but I think it's worth parents hearing to the extent that they're that they're listening. If your child is being bullied, for example, you can use that filtering tool to filter out the words that are being typically used to bully them. And the reason this is really important is that a lot of times in the context of bullying, it is very hard for our systems to know that a comment is bullying. So you're at school all day, you're wearing a skirt, all the kids at school are making fun of that particular skirt. On our platform, you've got a picture of yourself posted with that skirt on and someone writes, nice skirt. And they mean it in a bullying and mean way. And you have all that context because you've just spent a day being bullied at school. We don't have that context. To us, it just looks like nice skirt. You can put those words into that filtering tool to filter out those comments and, and cut that bullying off. So this tool is very versatile. It can be used in all the ways that you just described. It can be used in very personal situations. And I, I agree with you. I think it's one of our most powerful tools. I, I absolutely love it. And, you know, you can put words in there just as, a, you know, ugly, fat, kill yourself, things like that, that you don't ever want in your comments or on your child's comments. And, and it, it just goes on and on. And it's, it's a phenomenal tool for blocking any kind of inappropriate um, words and comments coming onto your 
your page or your profile. So thank you for putting that there. Um, lastly, are there any legislative aspects um, to regulating online safety for kids that you can talk about that Meta is putting forth? I think it would be beneficial. We think it would be beneficial to parents to have some sense of like, wherever I go on the internet, wherever my teens are accessing apps, that they have the ability to know that there's a sort of a certain standards that are set in, set in place. Standards around age appropriate content, standards around what, what um, is an age appropriate experience. Um, I think, for example, you know, we have parental supervisory tools. And there's a lot of discussion about, um, about giving parents an opportunity to consent or, or having us verify age. So I'll tell you one of the things that we do on our platform. If we see someone as potentially an age liar, we put them through a flow to try to um, have them to have them verif to verify their age. That's really important because a lot of our safeguards are dependent on knowing, having some awareness, awareness of your age. So right now we are really urging um, legislators to come together to develop some standards in this area so that, that parents know that wherever they are on the internet, these are the things that are put that are that are put in place. In the meantime, from our perspective, we're going to try to provide age appropriate experiences. We're going to try to have an awareness of age so that we can make sure that those age appropriate experiences are going to the, to the people that they should go to. Um, but we we would look we would very much welcome some standards for industry in this area. Thank you, Antigone. I think that's gonna wrap up this episode so far. Um, I wanna thank you so much for coming on and talking to my audience about this. It's a very, very vital and important conversation for parents and teenagers to have um, about social media and have to keep themselves safe and protect them from bad people. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for giving them this information. Thank you for listening to the Marisol Nichols podcast. And please do not forget to click like and subscribe. And a big shout out to WD Hahn for our theme song, Something's Gotta Change. See you next time.